Our gracious Father, we thank you again that we've been able to come together to once again open your word and hear your words of peace. Lord, in a world of conflict, a world that is ruled with power, by powers who want to bring us down, that want to separate us from you, we need the assurance that there is one that can hold us closely to you. And Father, in Christ we find this peace and we find this comfort. And so Lord, now as uh, we begin to open your word, I just pray your blessing upon each one of us here that we will be bound to you with cords that will never be broken. In Jesus' name. Amen. One. This morning uh, is, is comfort. I believe every one of us loves to have a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. A place where we can just feel relaxed, where we feel no pressures, no conflict. Just, we can think more clearly when we're in a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. True? Mm -hmm. you know, when we're stressed, when we're in conflict, what, you know, when, when do we say the wrong things? When do I say the wrong things? <laughs> when, when I'm stressed at the heat of the moment, just the wrong thing will come out of me because I'm not in a place of comfort. In our Christian walks, uh, the devil wants to lead us into a place where we are outside of the comfort zone, not just my comfort zone, not your comfort zone, but God's comfort zone for us. The devil wants to drag us out of that and then come at us because he knows we'll surely fall. But if we're in Christ, we shall not fall. There's something beautiful, something special, just about that word, comfort. You know, from the time that we're little children, in our mother's arms, in our father's arms, we find, we find this place of comfort. It doesn't matter what's going on around us, something frightens us, where do we run? I used to run to mum. Yeah. Run to mum. Because there's a place of comfort. Grab a leg, grab a skirt, grab something. As long as there's something to grab on. <sighs> Why? Because mum's bigger, mum's stronger, mum's more comfortable. She's comforting. She's always comforted me. And so I'd run to mum. But security? Exactly. There's security. But as I was thinking this through in preparation, I was thinking, hey, it goes, it goes even back before we were actually born. From the time that we're conceived, we find a place of comfort, a place to grow, a place to develop, the place to become the person that we would be when we're born. David said in the Psalms that God knew my substance. Before I was born. Well, yeah, anyway, yeah, something like that. And, um, and so from the time that we're conceived, we've, we have a comfort place. We have a place of shelter, a place of security, and a place of sustenance for us to grow and develop until we're born. Now, these three basic needs are supplied in this environment in order that we may grow. It reminds me, oh actually, the spiritual implication of this, the spiritual implication of this is, is fascinating. The, that being in somebody else is a place where we can grow, the place that we can develop, the place that where we find our shelter, security and sustenance. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. I'm sure that you can all agree, as we've come together at this time, this precious time, this weekend and the week to follow, that there is a special spirit 
this, over this cat ground. And within that spirit, has anybody not felt comfortable? Maybe that's the wrong question. I'm sure everybody's felt comfortable. I have felt just beautifully comfortable in this place. Mm. Special. They work in the van in my car, I'm like. <laughs> we can leave our cars unlocked. <laughs> and still sleep comfortably. That's right. yeah. Yeah, still sleep comfortably. Beautiful. All right. So the first one of those three words that I've mentioned, you know, shelter, security, and sustenance, is the shelter. We have a hymn, don't we? Shelter in the time of storm. The Lord's my rock. rock. The Lord's my rock. In Him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. There's a couple of interesting verses in the Bible. Um, Job 24 verse 8. We all know Job's story. Job 24. And verse 8. They are wet with the showers of the mountains and embrace the rock for want of shelter. They embrace the rock for want of shelter. Reminds me of a time when uh, Mum and Ken and I, those of you that know Mum and Ken, my stepfather, uh, we were out at Carnarvon Gorge. And uh, we've been you know, walking up through the gorge and, and, and up. Right up the end, there's a, a cave. If anyone's ever been there, I'm sure a lot of us have been there. But there's this cave right up the end. And so we've gone, we've gone for our walk up to the cave. But while we were up that end, these clouds started to form and started to slowly, slowly come across. In fact, we were watching them come across as we were walking up. And, and I remember thinking, I wonder if we'll get all the way up there and all the way back before the storm hits. Uh, we didn't. <laughs> and so we sort of made a plan. Let's stay under the shelter of the rock. And then when the storm hit, bang, there was thunder, there was lightning, there was, the, the rain was really heavy. And uh, we remained dry, sheltered, secure, beautiful. Not a problem when you're under such a massive outcrop. In Psalms 61 verse 3, Psalm 61, verse 3. Sorry, Psalm 61, 1, 2, and then 3. Mm. Mm. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me, and a strong tower from the enemy. Just as my mum was my shelter, my security, when I was a little fella, God has proved to be my shelter, my rock, uh, throughout my life. Jesus is a wonderful saviour. Jesus is the rock <coughs> of my salvation. Praise God. And so... I know that being on the rock doesn't mean that there's not going to be any storms around. We can be in the shelter of the cave up at Carnarvon Gorge, but that doesn't make the storm go away. It just means we can stay sheltered during that storm. That's exactly what happened. And the same in our Christian experience. There are going to come things from right field, from left field. There are going to come storms, there are going to come waves that want to overwhelm us, to take us down, and Satan wants to try and keep us under. But we don't need to remain under. Because there is a rock. And there's some beautiful places down, down uh, just over the, the border in New South Wales, Bogongar, or places like that. You know, the, the, the waves come, can come hurtling in, and the rocks just sit there. Hey, those rocky outcrops just sit there. And when you're up on top, not a problem. Christ, we can hide under Christ. We can hide on Christ. We can hide in Christ. Christ is the rock that doesn't get moved by Satan. It doesn't get moved by anything. So 
So let us, like Job, embrace the rock for want of shelter. There are other occasions where God sheltered his people from danger. Can we think of any? I've got some written there, but can anybody think of a time when God sheltered someone or some people from danger? The Exodus? Yeah? The army was behind? Mm -hmm. Fire by night, cloud by day. Mm -hmm. Amen. Noah, beautiful, there's an ark. He was in. He and his family were in. In the ark. Shelter. Security. And even the sustenance was supplied. Everything they took on board was a gift given by God. Beautiful. David and his men hiding in a cave. Hey, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Don't you? The the up in the rocks Amen. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in a fire. They went under a rock. They had the rock beside them in the fire. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a serious one. Amen. That's good. All righty. Um, The di uh, dictionary definition uh, for security, the second one on my list, shelter then security. The dictionary definition of security, free from danger. It's a nice place to, place to be, free from danger. To come aside a while and rest, come aside and rest a while. Jesus said, we, we just need to come aside and just rest from the danger that's around us. Um, free from danger, the rod. Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff, what do they do? They comfort me. Yeah, the protection of the Good Shepherd. Um, another definition, free from anxiety. Great peace have they which love thy law. And everything will bother them? No, nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119 verse 165. Another definition, firmly fixed. I can't help but think of John 15. Abide in me. Firmly fixed, firmly attached. And number four, reliable. How reliable is our God? Eternally reliable, amen? Absolutely. In all of our experiences, if we just stopped and, and, and just meditated, and, and we probably do this daily, but you know, if we just stopped and thought about God's, God pulling through for us, coming through in a clinch when things were looking tough. God always comes through. So if we're in Him, if we're in Christ, we're going, we can just continue to go through. There's a whole bunch of synonyms for secure. And... Uh, yeah, I'll just read them out, and each one could possibly just put a thought into your mind. Immune. Okay, cinnamons for secure. Immune. Security from disease. Bible verses. I won't take the time to go into it, but there's so many promises about our health. Immune. Impregnable. Out of harm's way. Protected. Safe. Sheltered. Shielded. Unassailable, undamaged, unharmed. Dependable, fastened, firm, fixed, fortified, immovable, stable, steady. Or it reminds me of Jesus. He is all these things. Assured, certain, confident, easy, reassured, sure. And then absolute, conclusive. Definite. Interesting one. In the bag. Secure. It's in the bag. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, that's in the bag. It's in the book. Maybe we should put that one in and bring up the dictionary guy. Put it in the book. That's secure if you're in the book. Reliable, solid, steadfast, tried and true, well founded. This is Jesus Christ. Amen. We can find our comfort in Him. Satan has learned, though, that he can reach into the place of shelter. 
and, and there's some ugly thoughts that I had about this in genocide, in war, how soldiers go through to the mothers that are with child, still carrying child, and, and, and do the most grotesque, disgusting things. And, and Satan knows that he can reach into that security, into that shelter, into that place where that child was receiving sustenance and growing, and he can destroy life. But as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, what about us before we were born again? Satan keeps, has, was at us through all kinds of ways and means and methods to try and destroy this, destroy this child from ever being born again. Destroy us as adults from ever being born again. Fascinating. But we have a God who knows the end from the beginning. We have a God that knew us before we knew Him. Who was already in the battle for us long before we knew that there was a battle. All praise belongs to our God. The third aspect of comfort that I mentioned was sustenance. Whilst shelter and security are vital to our well-being, we must remember that without sustenance, there can be no growth. And I'm sure we're all aware that if something is not growing, it is dying. dying. That's what we say. And uh, that, that's why it's not safe for any Christian to rest on their laurels and just think, yeah, I'm sheltered. How long, can, how long could we have stayed up in that cave without coming out? We didn't have food with us. How long could we have stayed there and been, oh, we're secure. How good is this? <laughs> yeah, we could last so long. You know, we, we needed water. We had so much water, but we still needed water at some time. We still needed food at some time. We could have gone on, you know, for... A considerable period of time without food. But there comes a time when you need new, fresh sustenance. And same within our Christian lives. We need a continual filling of the sustenance of God. We need a continual filling of His Spirit. A continual filling of His Word. A continual filling of the fellowship of God the Father and the Son as we come together. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. All of these add to the sustenance and growth and development and lifting up of, uh, of our souls. Give us strength for our spiritual walk. Good sustenance, like the word itself suggests, sustain, um, suggests well, let's say that again. Good sustenance, like the word itself suggests, sustains life in the best possible state. And we want that in our spiritual life. To sustain our spiritual life in its best possible state. I'm sure none of us go out of the way to do something to make ourselves sick. It's hard enough to stay healthy in this world without intentionally going out of our way to be sick, physically. But what a, so, we have learned, you know, as Adventists, we, we have a health message. Because we know that that's going to promote good health. But what about our spiritual walk? Again, we know that there's certain things that promote good health. The Word of God. And so that's why we, and, and praise God that we're all here. Praise God, because we all share. Um, it, it's, it's funny, something just popped into my head. <clears throat> Sometimes I think we treat church like fast food, like a takeaway. We pop in on a Sabbath morning, we go, you know, okay, pastor, uh, yep, yeah, oh, man, that took too long to serve up, you know, and go home, and, and, and then that's our fast food for the week, and we go, you beauty. There's no fast food on this campground. I haven't noticed it yet. <laughs> the sermons are not fast. <laughs> A bit of indigestion. Yeah. No indigestion. Oh, sorry. I misheard that over the line. No indigestion. 
Yeah, because we're eating at a beautiful pace. Yeah. Yeah. We're, not, we're not gorging ourselves really fast. No we're just No GMO. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. No GMO. Lots of spiritual food. Lots of spiritual food. <laughs> Straight from the throne room of God. Down through the channel as we just learned before. Okay. Um, beautiful. It's organic. Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see. That the Lord is good. Amen. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. And then taste and see that God is good. I'm thinking about the security. I'm thinking of a child. And we would have all seen this if not done it ourselves. We've been in a swimming pool and we say to the little child, Jump, I'll catch you. Amen? You've seen it? You've done it? Jump, I'll catch you. And then the little fellow the first time is like, mm, he's building up his trust. Oh, I cannot trust. I've never done this before. And you know, finally the jump into the arms and you catch. You catch the little fellow. But I was thinking, I've never seen an adult stand on the side of the pool with a little kid with the floaties on in the water go, catch me! <laughs> Why not? Because the greater always catches the smaller. That's why we can trust in God. He is the rock. He is the great one, the almighty, the one that never misses a catch. He is always there to catch us. No matter how hard the devil tries to push us over. When the Father says, jump, come to me, jump, trust me. Can we trust him? We can trust him. And the more we do it, the more fun it is. Hey, the first time we do that, jump, oh, okay, and then it's like, put me back on the side, I want to jump again. It's just great to jump into our Father's arms. Amen. Amen. So, what I want to do now is, is I want to just focus across to Jesus' life. Because he's my example in all things. Where did Jesus find his comfort during his time on earth? Where did Jesus? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. He loved coming aside. Into, he found his peace there, his beautiful tranquility, in prayer. Uh, beautiful. Excellent answers. That's the one. And that's what I want to bring out. The close association with his father is where he found his comfort. In nature, he found his rest. But he was resting in his father, in his in the nature. Um, as I read in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, I find that Jesus was born in a world that loved him. No. <laughs> no. Received him not. It came to his own, and they received him not. He was born in a world that hated him. As a child, uh, using an age-old idiom, Jesus was born like a fish out of water. Like root out of a dry ground. Amen. I remember there's a song that uh, I think Don McLean used to sing about Vincent Van Gogh, and it said, This world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. And, and, and that was a fascinating lyric to me when I was young. But when I became a Christian and I heard that song, I, my mind went to Jesus. This world, the way that it had become because of us, because of the ones he loved, because of the ones he created, it had become so ugly and so full of hatred towards the things of God that when Jesus was born, it was an automatic, it was a given that the world was going to hate him because Satan was going to make sure of it. Herod wanted him out of the way from a baby. That, that's how much that Satan feared Jesus Christ. As a baby, he was scared of him. I've got to get him out of the way. If this child grows, I'm a goner. That's how it was. And so Jesus grew up in a family. He grew up in a community. And uh, he would have had his battles. He would have had some serious battles. Now, I've just got to quote that's in my Bible. Can find it. Oh, here we go. 
Uh, it's not a scriptural reference, but it's um, from Youth's Instructor. Uh, in Psalm page 1070 in my Bible. <coughs> And so, uh, 1070 in, oh, I have a different cover, um, in the study Bible with the Ellen White colors. Okay? It's got Ellen White comments underneath it. It is not correct to say, as many writers have said, that Jesus was like all children. He was not like all children. Many children are misguided and mismanaged. But Joseph, and especially Mary, kept kept before them the remembrance of their child's divine fatherhood. Jesus was instructed in accordance with the sacred character of his mission. His inclination to write was a constant gratification to his parents. The questions he asked them led them to study most earnestly the great elements of truth. Fascinating. As a child, he was asking questions of his parents that sent them back to the scriptures. His soul-stirring words about nature and the God of nature opened and enlightened their minds. I, I love walking with these guys. We, we went for a walk yesterday. They're just the most beautiful things open up when God's people get together. It must have been beautiful for um, Joseph and Mary to have this child that was, was just triggering these thoughts with questions that inspired them to go back and read more. After we came back from our walk, and then we had the bonfire, and I'm like, time for bed. Guys are like, come down and have another chat, you know, another read of a word, or you know, have a look at a subject. And it's like, oh yeah, off we go again. <laughs> <laughs> times are refreshing. You don't want to sleep through times are refreshing. <laughs> put your floaties on. Put, put your floaties on the jump in. That's it. Beautiful. Um, so Jesus wasn't like other children. He, he was different, and so if his. Um, if the world that he lived in was like the world I grew in, uh, grew up in, uh, we didn't treat kids that were different real kindly. And I won't go into any more than that, but as kids we can be cruel. You know, we were cruel. Um, yeah, yeah, that pretty sums up a page of my notes. So, yeah. We scapegoat, we pay out on others to make ourselves feel better. Jesus would have copped it big time as a child. He really would have. And, and yet, he had a shelter, he had a security, he had spiritual and, and, and all other kinds of sustenance through the spirit of his father, his heavenly father, but also through his mum and dad. And that's important as well, not to forget that. You know, the shelter and security, the channel, father, through his spirit and down, or now through Christ and down through us, down through our children. Adrian's beautifully taught us these lessons many times. Um, so we move from, from that when Jesus was a little child to the time when he was 12 years old. Now when he was 12, they go up to the temple for the first time. And the same spirit, the same mindset, they kept going up to mum and dad and asking them questions. Um, which sent them back to the Word, inspired them to study nature and study God. He did the same thing he did in the temple. He went to these leaders and he's saying, well, I don't know what he questioned them with, but he just threw questions out to them to stimulate their mind, to lift up the level of their thinking, to try and get them to go back to the scriptures and see what God had laid out clearly. Um, I, I don't think it worked yeah. as well with the the leaders as it did with his mum and dad. It's obvious that it didn't work out as well. I wonder how many of them remember this little boy when they saw Jesus as a man. Mm. Good question. Mm. Wonder how many remembered this little boy when Jesus came as a man. Mm. Very good question. And then Jesus as uh, as he was up there in Jerusalem uh, witnessed the first sacrifice. He saw the first sacrifice. And those, uh, we, we've read Desire of Ages where uh, just something clicked, didn't it? We read where Sister Lord says something just clicked in his mind when he saw the lamb being slain. It was like, that's me. That's me. And from that point, as a 12 year old, he, just, he, he knew he had a mission from his father. And it was. 
pain, to be the lamb, to die for the sins of the whole world. Amazing. Now, let's get back to the notes to refocus. All of a sudden, this world changed. The focal point of his life was now revealed to him, and he knew what his destiny would be. Now, nothing else seemed to matter. And he drank up that moment with thoughts and feelings that I, I mean, I couldn't express. I don't know what was going through his mind, but it must have been an incredible sensation to realize the depth of who he was and the mission that was before him. But, whatever his thoughts and feelings were, there must still have been a profound peace in his heart because he knew he was doing his father's will. Interesting. He must have had a deep inner sense of comfort knowing that he was in his heavenly Father's will and that he could go forward with the confidence and assurance that his Father would be wow. with him every step of the way. What did Jesus say? John 16.32 I am not alone for the Father is with me. Beautiful verse. I am not alone for the Father is with me. This was the comfort that kept him strong, knowing that he was in his Father, and his Father in him. From that moment as a um, as a 12 year old, getting back to this, he was single minded. He was not afraid to be left alone without his mum and dad around in, in the temple. He wasn't afraid of a bunch of learned men that were throwing questions at him. He wasn't uh, afraid to even ask questions. He had inner peace and comfort of knowing he was about his father's business. We remember that when Joseph and Mary came back later on. Like, Son, where have you been? You were supposed to be just behind us. And he said, like, don't you know? It's about my father's business. He was focused. <clears throat> I often wonder where he went, where he went during those three days, in, like up at the temple. Where was his shelter? Where, where, who was feeding him? Who was looking after him? Uh, I don't know. Has anybody ever read anything about that? How he was being looked after? Yeah. Well, I know his heavenly father was still his shelter, still looking after him. Um, Matthew 6.25-34 to 34. Maybe we won't read all of it. Um, he starts off in 25 saying, Therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you'll drink, nor yet for your body, or what you'll put on, etc., etc., etc. And then he gives a few examples um, of God looking after nature. Then he comes down to verse 32. <clears throat> for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things for itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. And when I was reading this, in the context of what I've just been saying, I was thinking, as a 12 year old, he's probably already practicing that. And so later on he was able to preach those same things. Take no thought for tomorrow. He was about his father's business in the temple. And his, I'm sure the Father supplied somebody to feed him. You know? That which comforted Jesus and inspired him was the realization that he was on a mission from his heavenly Father. The Father was with him. Uh, think about that for a moment today in your life. <coughs> Jesus was, what, was where he needed to be at that particular time in our lives. Are we today where we need to be? An answer for all of this. Amen. I believe we're supposed to be here today. <laughs> That's what the whole camp's been about, isn't it? We're supposed to be here. Praise God. Now, having just noticed that Jesus told his mum and dad he must be about his heavenly father's business, we need to look at what happened next in his life. He went back to Nazareth and started working in his carpenter shop. 
He didn't just say, I'm not taking up a trade. I'm, I'm not doing mundane work. I've got better things to do. He knew his mission, yes. But he also knew that his mission was to be in accordance with his father's will and his father's timing. And we've learned a lot about timing, haven't we? In, in, in our lessons together. God has certain times ordained for us to do certain things, to go certain places, and I'm sure he's got a map lined out, I know he's got a map lined out for a uh, dear brother over here, um, on certain years. God had a blessing, and a blessing, and a blessing. And then when we come into line with God's blessings, we are going to grow, when we're going to get the sustenance that we require to grow even more quickly. You know, we can, we can water the garden every day. You know, anybody's gardeners, I'm sure there's a lot of gardeners here, we can water the garden every day, and then every week, and then every day, and every week, and just keep watering, 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 and the plants will grow so much, and you think, why are they looking sickly? Have we given them sustenance? Have we prepared the soil? Are we giving them new sustenance? And God has appointed times to give us uh, a boost. Fertilize our Christian walk. Make us grow. And quicker. So as we come under the shower of God's watering can, we're going to grow. Better than if we weren't under the shower of the watering can. <coughs> so he didn't say, I've got better things to do. He went about his daily business, but still, went, he, he, um, but still knew where his father needed him to be. It was 15 to 20 years um, later before Jesus went down to the Jordan to be baptized and take up his teaching and preaching and healing ministry, etc. Um, and so for us, we don't all need to you know, give up our jobs today. We don't need to give up our jobs next week. It's all in God's timing for us as individuals. For us as his children, our Father will let us know what he wants us to do. Just stay in tune. Just stay in tune with God. So may I say, therefore, that Jesus was in his comfort zone, in a comfort zone, even while he was making furniture in his dad's shop. Amen? There's nothing mundane in life. There's nothing mundane in any of our jobs, any of our vocations. Because we're not married to a job, we still have the freedom to go out, to go to studies, to go to our Sabbaths, to come to these meetings, as God desires us to do. And we can still be in a comfort zone with normal jobs. While he came to understand his mission in life, he didn't just drop everything and rush ahead of his father's timing. He still fulfilled his role as a son of Joseph and Mary. He still interacted with his brothers and sisters and neighbours as any normal child would. But through all and during... But through and during all this, Jesus was in preparation mode for his ultimate role in life, to reveal his Father to the world, to unfold and manifest his will to the people, and to bring healing and comfort to those who needed it. We can learn a lot from that, eh? Having received comfort from his Heavenly Father, he was able to pass that comfort on to those he came into contact with every day. Again, a good lesson for us. Um, Alright, after his baptism... After his baptism... Oh, no, let's go back a bit, sorry. By the time Jesus reached the Jordan River on the day of his baptism, he was in the zone. He was right to the point where he'd been called. His whole life was leading up to this point to begin his mission. And his mission was leading to the destiny of Calvary. Not that Jesus, you know, he was in the zone now, but not that he was ever out of the zone when it comes to God's will for him. But he was exactly where he needed to be at that time. And he was prepared mentally, physically and spiritually for the things that would come to pass in his life. Now, I'm not saying that he'd already crossed all his bridges, like he's in the zone and like, hey, it's all cool now, and it didn't matter. He hadn't crossed his bridges. But he was in the zone as far as his preparation, his relationship with his father, everything where it was needed to be 
ready for his next step. And that's an important part of our lives. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, is the preparation that we're going through now is so important for what is going to come ahead. <coughs> I still haven't got my head around a lot of things, but I'm in preparation mode. I got a little sponge up here, and uh, it's all getting in there, must be. And I'm just trusting God. You know, I'm just trusting God that it's just slowly going in, going in, uh, and, and doing its work, uh, so that one day it'll come out through the power of the Spirit and just be the right sustenance for somebody else, the right comfort for somebody else. After his baptism, Jesus went out to the wilderness where he was tempted of the devil. And as I was thinking about his experience in the wilderness, something struck me. Where was his shelter during this time in the wilderness? Where was his security during this time in the wilderness? And where was his sustenance during this time in the wilderness? For sure, his, sus his shelter and security and sustenance was his father's presence and his father's word. Perhaps Jesus was reflecting on the words of Psalm 91 as he fasted and prayed in the wilderness. Psalm 91, we'll just look at a couple of the first verses there. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Can you hear shelter and security in those verses? Amen. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and fortress. My God in Him will I trust. I am sure Jesus knew these words. Probably some of his favourite Bible verses, if I'm allowed to say these are the favourite verses out of the Scriptures. Um, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Beautiful. <clears throat> when the devil comes along and tempts him to turn the stones to bread, Jesus had been in his Father's presence sheltering, receiving security, comfort, and sustenance for 40 days. The devil comes along and says, these stones, turn them to bread. Come on, if you're the Son of God, you know, serve yourself. It'll be fine, we can do that. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. As I thought about that, I was thinking, Jesus had been feasting with the Father. Feasting with the Father. And so when the Satan, come, comes, when Satan comes along and says, here, turn these stones into bread, Jesus is probably like, I'm full. I've been feasting with the Father. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I don't need anything else at this time. Amen? Amen. How beautiful. And of course, Satan tried to tempt Jesus a couple more times. He, he tempted Jesus to try and help himself. And that's what he tries to make us do. To try and help ourselves. We don't need God. We can make things right. Abraham tried to make things right. You know, there are so many stories where they tried to make things right in the Bible and failed again and again and again. We need God's guidance and his word to tell us where to go. Um, I'm just going to skip a fair bit of stuff here. This time slipping away. Now I'd just like to read some passages from the Spirit of Prophecy. In yeah. So I've got here <clears throat> Ministry of Healing. Um, about 488, page 488. It sums up nicely how we should act in the face of trials. Sometimes we like to keep records of our trials and tribulations, like they're sort of trophies of, in our cabinet of self-pity. Um, sort of bring them out, oh, this is what I've been through, really tough, what was me, you know. Um, <clears throat> Well, let's just read. I'll just go straight into it. Alan White says, We are prone to look to our fellow men for sympathy and uplifting. And, and at times there's comforts in that. Uh, we've got to get the balance because there are other quotes that talk about comforting one another. 
There are there. They are there. Absolutely. But as we read through this whole passage, you'll understand what I'm saying. <laughs> We're prone to look to our fellow men for sympathy and uplifting instead of looking to Jesus. In mercy and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us. Do you hear that? God, in, in His mercy and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence in whom we place our confidence to fail us, now I continue, comma, in order that we may learn the folly of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. We don't want to just, just depend on each other. There is a greater, there is a rock. I am a sand. <laughs> That's bad grammar. Hey, I, I am sand. Don't trust in me. Don't. No foundation in heaven. Jesus is the rock. You know, I can give you comfort. You know, if you've been walking on uh, rocky ground and your feet are a bit sore and whatever, then you can come across to me and if I'm sad, you can find a little bit of peace. And that's nice, we can share, we can comfort another one. Ah, oh, your feet are on the, on the sand. But don't build on the sand. Can, can you see the difference? So there's comfort in both places, but one stands true and strong and is eternal. And we're just going <coughs> wrong and we sometimes shift. But there's moments where we need each other. Let us trust fully, humbly, unselfishly in God. He knows the sorrows that we feel to the depths of our being, which we cannot express. When all things seem dark and unexplainable, remember the words of Christ. What I do, thou knowest not. How many times have we reached the place and thought, what's God doing? And then later on we look back at our experiences and go, oh, now we know what God was doing. Yeah. He says, what, yeah, what I do thou knowest not, but I can t I'll finish the verse, but thou shalt know thereafter. Yeah, the whole verse. The history of Joseph, the history of Daniel. What stories? Instantly the, the whole stories can flash before our eyes, we know the stories. So long as we're in the world, we shall meet with adverse influences. There will be provocations to test the temper. And it is by meeting these in the right spirit that the Christian graces are developed. If Christ dwells in us, who dwells in us? If Christ dwells in us, you believe it? Amen. We shall be patient, kind, forbearing, cheerful amid frets and irritations. Day by day and year by year we shall conquer self and grow into a noble heroism. Come down a couple of paragraphs. When things are going difficult for us. It says, then talk of the promises. Talk of Jesus' willingness to bless. He does not forget us for one brief moment. That's an amazing thought. We're on his mind all day. Every day. When, notwithstanding disagreeable circumstances, we rest confidently, or confidingly, sorry, in his love and shut ourselves in with him, the sense of His presence will inspire a deep, tranquil joy. Of Himself, Christ said, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I, all, I do always those things that please Him. Notice the next sentence. The Father's presence encircled Christ. Father's presence in circle of Christ. And nothing, be, nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Everything that happened to Christ was for a blessing upon the world. Amazing. The temptation of the wilderness, the experiences as a child. The experiences during his ministry, that rotten last 24 hours, 48 hours in his life, nothing befell him which in, that which infinite love permitted for a blessing for the world. Could that be the same in our lives? Amen, brother. Just thinking the same thing. Can that be the same for us when we go through tough times?
times when they go through persecution, when, you know, the, the things that happened to me as a child uh, have imprinted themselves into who I am, the things that I battle with and struggle with, but God can work through those things. And, and only as the Master can, He can turn that around and use my experiences to be a blessing to others. And He can use your experiences to be a blessing to others. That's a marvel. That's a miracle. That's a sign that God could do that. And we're experiencing that this weekend. <clears throat> Just got two more passages, two more little quotes, and then, it's up. then, then I'm done. Steps to Christ, 125. But even here, Christians may have the joy of communion with Christ. They may have the light of His love, the perpetual comfort of His presence. Amen. Every step in life may bring us closer to Jesus. May give us a deeper experience of His love. And may bring us one step nearer to the blessed home of peace. Then let us not cast away our confidence, but have firm assurance. Firmer than ever before. Hitherto has the Lord helped us, and He will help us to the end. Let us look to the monumental pillars, reminders of what the Lord has done to comfort us and to save us from the hand of the destroyer. Let us keep fresh in our memory all the tender mercies that God has shown us. The tears He has wiped away, the pains He has soothed, the anxieties removed, the fears dispelled, the wants supplied, the blessings bestowed. Thus, strengthening ourselves for all that is before us through the remainder of our pilgrimage. How precious are those words? All of these negatives can be turned around as a positive, as a strengthener, a, um, a strengthener of our faith to trust in God for the remainder of our pilgrimage. And I close with some words from Desire of Ages, page 324. When the soul surra surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. A change is wrought which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work, bringing a supernatural element into human nature. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress. Did you get that? The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes Christ's fortress. He is inside you, and He's going to protect His fortress, isn't He? Amen? Beautiful. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes His own fortress, which He holds in a revolted world, and He intends that no authority shall be known in it but His own. His word will reign supreme, and His presence will reign supreme in His fortress, our souls. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. Whatever he tried to do to us before we were born again, to try and stop our growth and development, now that we have been born again, that we are in Christ, have become his fortress, we become impregnable unless we walk away. He is a shelter that is immovable, a security that cannot be altered. We have to stay there. We must inevitably, but unless, sorry, but unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one. We must inevitably be under the control of the one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. It is not necessary for us to deliberately choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its uh, dominion. We have only to neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. If we do not cooperate with heavenly agencies, Satan will take possession of the heart. And that's the danger. We must cooperate. We must abide. We must stay attached. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ. The indwelling of, dwelling of Christ. Not someone else. The indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in His righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected with God, this is the reverse, God channeled 
God, Jesus, us. So the connection, the vital connection is the reverse. Us, Jesus, God. That's how we're connected with the Father. Through Christ. Unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love and self-indulgence and temptation to sin. The old man still resides. <laughs> and we have to keep putting him down. He remains, but he doesn't reign. Christ reigns in his uh, fortress. We may leave off many bad habits for a time, we may part company with Satan, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to Him moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and continual communion, we are, are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do His bidding. I don't want to finish on a negative note. <coughs> We're talking about comfort today. As Christ received his comfort through his Father, through his Father's presence, he said, I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. And in these words, we've just learned about, the, or we've just been reminded about the indwelling of Christ. We are not alone, for Christ is with us. Christ is in us. If we believe that, if we believe that Christ is in us, nothing can stand against us. For he that is with us. Sorry? Yeah. He that is with us is more than the thing yeah, than those that are against us. And so I just offer you Jesus, people. Nothing less. Thank you. I offer you Jesus, the Comforter. For when the Comforter has come, the Spirit of Truth, the indwelling of Christ, you shall be comforted. And you shall go on to the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, I am just so grateful that we can come before you and bend your knee and acknowledge the comfort that flows from the throne of heaven. The Bible records the world words, God of all comfort, the Father of mercies. And Father, I thank you that each one of us has found this experience to be true. That in Christ, we can find all the comfort from, that flows down from um, our Father above and sweeps over our souls forever. Lord, I pray that each person will, will know that comfort, experience that comfort, walk in that comfort from now on into eternity. And may the devil and his evil ones never, ever be able to impregnate or, or, or to break through, to breach the wall. Lord, this is what we don't want. We don't want to breach in a wall. We want to be securely locked in with Jesus. May this be our experience forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.